There's been a lot of discussion in recent times around the government's approach to superannuation moving forward, and in particular in an election year, it's certainly become top of mind for many people in the industry. There is a move, I guess, that goes back to or back from the Henry Tax Review to try and build greater levels of equality into Australia's superannuation system. And we have seen some of that information begin to filter out in recent times, in particular where the Labor government flagged uh, potentially uh, a reintroduction of uh, the pensions being accessible for higher account balance earners between 800,000 and a million and potentially above. Uh, Minister or Prime Minister uh, Julia Gillard has come out and stated that this wouldn't happen for the over 60s, but I think uh, you have certainly flagged that there will be some changes in respect to superannuation going forward to make sure that it can remain sustainable from a uh, revenue perspective. I guess one thing that I've um, really taken a close look at since its introduction back in 2007 with the simpler super reforms has been the proportioning rule that was introduced with retirement income streams. And to me, this has always been the biggest change that I've seen, uh, bigger than, I guess, the over 60 tax-free status um, that was actually introduced because in many instances, I actually believed that the um, tax benefit wasn't significant because many clients that I w had at that time really were paying very low rates of tax due to the um, tax-free money or undeducted money that they had in there, but also in the way that the tax offsets would also apply to them as well. So for me, I guess it was this proportioning rule that I found quite interesting because in essence it allowed someone the ability to lock in that proportion and a very high tax-free proportion and in essence grow what was previously their undeducted contributions. And I think this is an area, if they're going to look at from a policy perspective, should think about how they may want to revisit this as an issue um, if they're looking at other ways in which to attract government revenues. So let's just have a quick look hit here at an example. We've got Chris, he's 60 years of age. He's got an account balance within his fund of, say, $800,000. One of the most common strategies that advisors use is a recontribution strategy of $450,000. So he takes himself up to that limit. Um, he then decides to commence an income stream where he would take the minimum pension out of it. So what we've got is a tax-free proportion of now some 56 and a quarter percent. Now you could end up in a situation where you could be running multiple pensions, but ultimately I'm just trying to keep this example as simplistic as possible. And we obviously have a net earning rate and as you could also understand and appreciate, the net earning rate would ultimately affect quite significantly the, the end balances uh, either in a positive or negative light. But I guess what I wanna highlight here is, is what this proportioning rule has actually done since Simpler Super was introduced and what the end result would have been in a pre-Simpler Super environment. And you can see here, looking at this table, um, we've got a situation here where the blue line, it, which is a previously was sort of a bell curve that started from 55 years of age, over time, once you get to about 72 or 73 years of age, you actually had a situation where the pension that was required to be withdrawn was greater than the earnings that the fund could ultimately generate. Conversely, in an account-based pension, as long as the minimum pension was less than what the fund would outperform, you would end up in a situation where the account balance would continue to grow. And what you end up with here as well in a tax-free component or proportion environment is a continued growth of that tax-free money. By comparison, under the old rules where you had a undeducted purchase price, um, those monies that the individual tipped in were basically amortized over the life of the individual. So you can see by the time someone's reached 82 or 83 in this situation, the undeducted or tax-free component money had basically been whittled away. What does that mean? Well, you can see here from a policy perspective what that difference means at age 70, at age 80, and at age 90. 
And that's the difference in the tax-free status of that member's superannuation interest, which we're talking about anywhere between twenty-eight and a half thousand dollars here, at subject to a fifteen percent rate, let alone that it could be sixteen and a half, through to some sixty-eight and a half thousand dollars worth of tax that would need to be paid by the estate just by virtue of the different way in which the proportioning rule worked rather than applying an amortization of an individual's own money over the life of the income stream that they may be drawing. So to me, I guess that's one real obvious difference. If the government was looking at ways in which to, I guess, address the issue of the greater equality, in, in terms of uh, tax revenues from superannuation, to me, that appears to be an obvious gap that they could fix and would, uh, in my opinion, I guess, they would collect more money from the higher account balance members, in particular if they're targeting SMSFs, but then I guess it would have lesser of an impact within the lower income environment. So for me, is the government's policy towards super all out of proportion? Potentially, yes. And what the Treasury has already clearly stated is any change that they need to look at needs to be given consideration to in terms of adequacy, in terms of sustainability and integrity. And to me, um, addressing this as an issue uh, certainly goes a long way to ensuring that those three elements that need to be tested are met. So for me, is the proportioning approach to retirement income streams out of proportion with Australia's retirement policy? Potentially it is. Um, it's something that, yes, has been in for five or six years, but ultimately I think um, to allow people to grow their non-concessional contributions with fund earnings um, logically doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I'm a advocate for uh, the contribution cap system simply because um, it sets an even playing field and doesn't impact those who actually outperform. Um, Rather, it just imposes a level playing field for what people can actually put into the fund. So anyway, that's my view in respect of it. I'd love to hear any comments you may have, which you can do through the blog. Thank you.